want to thank Pat again for putting together a wonderful, wonderful event. When I was inviting my panelists, uh, a few of them who've not been here before, I said, I, I don't know how to describe ISPCS because I can't relate it to any other event that I attend in the industry. And I live in DC, work in DC, so I attend a lot of events in DC, as you can imagine. This is not like that. This is smaller, it's more intimate. You meet people that you will create lifelong friendships with. You will learn things you didn't even know to ask about. You will be in the most beautiful part of the country or among the most beautiful parts of the country. I love the beach too. And you will eat exceedingly well. So I had no trouble filling this panel today. Uh, and I'm delighted that you're all here to share this um, info important information with us. Uh, we are interested in hearing your questions. I'm going to start the panel by asking questions of them. We'll start that conversation going and then bring you into the conversation. So just very briefly, I think a lot of you do know me, but I've been a lawyer in private practice for a couple of decades. Earlier this year, I decided to do it on my own. Um, I started my own law firm in May, Schroeder Law. I've got one young attorney working with me, and we do nothing but space and national security. And that's what I've loved my whole career. And I just hit a point where I said, that's all I want to do. So I hung up my own shingle and delighted to be doing it and delighted to have the support of friends like Pat. Um, uh, the people on the panel today are highly experienced members of the space, law, and policy arena. They represent different interests. They have really interesting opinions, and I'm going to turn it over to them now to share it with you. I'm going to ask each panelist to introduce themselves in a little more detail than, than what I'm going to do, and then we're going to launch into the questions. So we've got Dennis Burnett, who is a very long time and incredibly experienced not only space law professional, but, but business person in the aerospace industry. Melissa Force, who you know, of course, from our local, you know, New Mexico's own Spaceport America. Christopher Allison, Sierra Nevada Corporation. And Kelly Gerheim of United Launch Alliance. So, Dennis, can you start us off with, tell us about your background a little bit more and, and how you got to where you are today. Certainly. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. This is the first time I've been in this part of the country, um, although I've got family up in Durango, which isn't that far away, but uh, never had been down here. Um, so I started out uh, in 1978, uh, got recruited into the Comsat Corporation, which is uh, no longer in existence, uh, as a new, new business regulatory attorney working on commercializing remote sensing, and that's what I'm going to talk about today. So we were in right at the forefront with the, with the, the commercialization of Landsat, which didn't happen, uh, commercialization of the weather satellites, which didn't happen. But uh, what did happen was they, they passed the first uh, uh, commercialization legislation, 1984, which we were part of. And I've been doing this kind of work ever since. I've been in private practice. Uh, I went over to the dark side and worked in the uh, defense industry for about 10 years. Uh, and then retired from that and, and, and now do consulting, um, still as a lawyer, but uh, wearing a different hat. Thanks, Dennis. Yeah. Melissa. Well, I was a, a trial partner at a large law firm in Los Angeles at the turn of the century when I first found out about space law. So unlike Dennis, who has been in it since the beginning, um, I'm a relative newcomer, if you can call 20 years new. Um, but I only found out about space law because uh, an old law school friend of mine uh, was practicing space law in academia. Um, we collaborated on a few projects, um, and I fell in love. Um, but I was busy trying cases, and I largely had to watch space law from the sidelines. And it wasn't until I was practicing international law when I headed up an in-house uh, claims department for a global corporation that I actually got to do, any, do something about it. Uh, so I took a year sabbatical, which is a luxury most people don't get to take. But I moved to Europe, uh, spent a year studying space law, and got an LLM degree. And then my second big break came when I came back to the United States. I was lucky enough to work in NOAA's Office of Space Commercialization, which is now Space Commerce. Um, 
some of you may know that that office uh, performs um, a critical function in being the bridge between industry and new entrants and the federal agencies that are trying to work through the licensing and permitting processes. And it can be very complicated and complex. And the office uh, performed a great service in being able to make contacts for these people, help facilitate introductions, give guidance, and it was because of that experience that really helped me in my later consulting work and uh, also teaching law school. Um, in 2016, I got a call from the then executive director of Spaceport America asking me if I'd ever considered being a spaceport lawyer, which really just wasn't on my radar. Uh, I truly had not considered it. Um, but a few months later, I got a call from the then new executive director who had taken her place, and he flew to Los Angeles, and we had a heart-to-heart -heart talk. He told me about his vision of what the spaceport could be, and I think more importantly, we discussed you know, what part we could have in being part of the enduring legacy of commercial human space flight, which is just about to happen. And um, that really, that convinced me. A couple weeks later, I accepted in December of 2016, and I never looked back. I'm a spaceport lawyer and still learning every day, <coughs> but I love it. Thanks, Melissa. Christopher. Thank you. Um, so I am different uh, than my colleagues here on the stage. I do not have a legal background. I am not a lawyer. Uh, my degree is in aerospace engineering, and uh, I like to say my career was kind of a series of unfortunate events that always led to something way better. Um, so I started off uh, at Sierra Nevada Corporation working on satellites, uh, sequestration hit, uh, that job disappeared. Uh, luckily at the time, Dream Chaser was looking to absorb some systems engineers, and I went in really excited for the opportunity to work on this great program and didn't listen very well when they said, who wants to do the FAA licensing and regulatory work for Dream Chaser, <laughs> and was the one person who didn't step backwards. So mm -hmm. that's kind of how I got thrust into the position that I'm in. <laughs> Read a lot of books, learned up on it, <clears throat> consulted with a lot of people here on stage. Uh, you know, I'm very appreciative to the education that I've had over the last several years in, in the space law and the policy world. Um, but I think I bring a unique uh, perspective to the table. You know, my background is very rooted in physics and what is physically possible. And a lot of times I feel in the regulatory and the policy discussion, we lose sight of, you know, kind of our grounding here on Earth. Um, and so uh, on the Dream Chaser program, I'm our federal agency's uh, lead. So all things that are licensing uh, regulatory approval for the vehicle. Uh, so primarily interface with the FAA. Uh, in the recent years, I've had the, uh, the, the pleasure of being asked to represent SNC on the three aviation rulemaking committees that the FAA has hosted, uh, as well as uh, as a member of the Commercial Space Flight Federation. This last year, I led our regulatory committee through uh, the NPRM efforts and the submission of comments there. So have a lot of uh, recent track record in the policy world, and uh, it's an exciting time. Thanks, Christopher. And Kelly. And I am Kelly Gerheim. I'm an attorney at ULA. Uh, my background is in government contracts. I worked at, out of law school at a, a big national law firm in the government contracts practice group. And when ULA went through its kind of recent transformation about three years ago, some opportunities came up um, in the law department. So I made the transition um, as part of the effort to, for ULA to become more affordable and accessible to customers. Um, and I have been just having a blast ever since. So I'm involved with a lot of our government work because of my background, uh, but I also work, support our commercial program. So um, I'm responsible for our FAA licensing. I've been involved in the FAA uh, rulemaking process recently with Christopher and others. Um, and then I've helped with, uh, re uh, recently we sold our two certification flights for our new Vulcan Centaur rocket. So we've been working with SNC and with Astrobotic on that. So there's a lot of really great, exciting things happening at ULA. I feel really fortunate to um, be a part of it. And thank you, Francesca, for having me on the panel. My pleasure. And Kelly, you're a repeat performer. So you were very kind to do this for us last year, too. So thank you. I'm actually going to stand because I'm having trouble seeing down the line. 
So as I said, I'm going to start with questions to each panelist, and that'll get the conversation going, and then we'll bring you guys in. So Dennis, I'd like to start with, uh, with you because we're, the panel's going to talk a lot today about rulemaking, about licensing and regulation, not only of the launch industry, but of the payloads that fly on the vehicles and that get to orbit and that perform functions that you know, improve life on Earth. So Dennis, I know your experience with NOAA, that's NOAA's the organization within the Commerce Department that licenses remote sensing satellites, the you know, Earth observation sensors on satellites. And you know, Dennis, your experience goes back to the very first one, the very first privately owned commercial remote sensing system. And fast forward a couple decades, NOAA is looking at the regulations again. Um, what do you think? How, how were the regulations? Did we need a change? What does the change look like? Where are we going? Well, you know, I think we should start with the Presidential Directive 2. Okay. Right? And uh, the President's uh, set some expectations there. Um, and NOAA, you know, following their directive, uh, started a rulemaking to simplify their rules, deregulate a little bit, uh, make it more uh, quicker uh, response time for industry. Um, and, you know, it's very interesting because the expectation was so high that I think uh, there was no way they could probably meet that expectation, and they didn't, no. quite frankly. Um, what they've done is uh, proposed a rulemaking. Uh, it's been criticized by uh, a lot of the industry, uh, even their own advisory group, Acres has, has <laughs> filed comments uh, on their proposed rule saying, look, you didn't listen to what we, we advised you. Um, it's it's uh, kind of uh, unfortunate that the expectation was set too high. I don't think they managed the expectations very well. Who knows what's going to happen because uh, industry is in talking to the Commerce Department about this. The uh, Secretary of Commerce is interested to hear and has talked to various representatives in, of industry about this. So I don't know if they're going to have a new rule making or they're going to have an interim final rule or just what they're gonna do. We don't know yet. So were the problems related to you know, industry wanting um, you know, greater resolution or different applications that weren't being agreed to? Was it the cost of filing fees? But I mean, there aren't any filing fees at NOAA. No, was it, it the turnaround time of the license yeah, applications? It, like what it, are the like, big picture complaints? Yeah, the big, the big picture issue, uh, it, it, we share this with the FAA, is the interagency coordination. Takes too long? Takes too long. Yeah. Uh, we had a digital globe that went, what, two and a half, three years? to get their license to go from 40 centimeters to 20 centimeters. I'm not, I'm not exact on, on the resolution, but the problem was in the interagency, it's new, we have to think about it, we can't do anything until we've thought through the process and eliminated every risk. I, I think that's the approach that's been taken. So the expectation was that this, this interagency coordination would some how be streamlined, and uh, the proposed rule actually tries to do this. They've introduced the idea of low-risk systems and high-risk systems, um, and the low-risk have a certain set of conditions that are automatic and makes it very quick. But unfortunately, you know, the use of that terminology, low-risk and high-risk itself, it doesn't fit. Mm -hmm. I mean, I'm gonna, I would criticize them for using that. They shouldn't have said risk because where's the risk? They don't ever describe what risk they're talking about. Uh, we're concerned about national security risk, we're secure, uh, concerned about foreign policy risks, but if you do a risk analysis, you have to go deeper than that. You have to say, well, what risk, what's the specific risk are you talking about? And how is that a risk to the United States? And what they left out of the whole thing was, well, what's the risk to our industrial? security, what's the uh, risk to our, our economy? That's completely left out of this risk analysis. And if you're doing a good risk analysis, you wouldn't leave that out. So yeah, there's some problems. But I would say, look, they've, you know, we shouldn't complain when they make improvements because you know, it's better than it was. All right, they're trying. Yes. So just before we leave the, we leave the satellites for a minute and go to spaceports, 
Another agency that's responsible for licensing and regulation, regulation of the payload, so to speak, is the FCC. They license the use of the radio frequency spectrum. And the FCC also is in the middle of a, of a rulemaking specifically to address small satellites. And the FA, FCC's approach was a little bit different than NOAA's. And just from what I've heard through the grapevine, that process is maybe going a little bit more smoothly or maybe was, uh, is being viewed by industry a little more favorably. Um, I know one element of that rulemaking was to reduce the cost of the of the application fee, so that's always popular. Um, well, there's a yeah, that's a big difference because the FCC uh, by statute has to charge. Right. Um, and so uh, by by having this streamlined process for small satellites, uh, constellations of what five or less, and or whatever the number is, um, and of a certain size and a certain performance parameters and so forth, they've made it made it simpler and, and we have clients that are looking at that and saying, well, this is really, this is really a good opportunity to do some interesting, interesting things. I think it was very good. You know, there's a big difference between the way rulemaking is done in an independent regulatory right. uh, agency. Which like is what the, the FCC is. F, F, the FCC, and, and I grew up with the Federal Maritime Commission, which is really obscure, but uh, they, they also were independent. And the APA is a big deal. And so they're used to doing rulemaking and an analyzing the comments and making sure that there is a rationale for everything that they do based on the comments they receive from public. Uh, I think sometimes both NOAA and the FAA may have a little bit, uh, they don't have that experience. I mean, you're talking about the FCC, you were talking about since 1934, of, of, of complying with the Administrative Procedures Act mm -hmm. or the equivalent. So they've, they've got a lot more history and a lot more, I mean, it's institutionalized. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, I think that's one big difference. And when do you think, if you, if you know, when do you think we'll see a final rule out of the FCC on small sets? I have, well, they've adopted it, but haven't uh -huh. published it. Okay, so, yeah. so stay tuned. Stay tuned. Okay. Thank you, Dennis. Melissa, I'd like to turn to spaceports now. Sure. And um, so one thing that I find when I talk to people who want to operate as, at a spaceport is they really don't understand or they, you know, they want to learn about what's the relationship between a launch operator that comes to a spaceport, the payload owner that's going to fly on that launch vehicle that flies out of a spaceport. So can you tell us like a day in the life of talking to a would-be operator at your spaceport? What kind of questions do you get? What kind of contracts do you have with them? How does one, how does a commercial operator use a spaceport? That's a good question because I get it all the time. <laughs> um, the, it, it's probably best to start at the beginning in terms of all, like all good relationships, they start with an NDA and then some data sharing happens. And the, through that process, we learn about the research and development operations or the mission profile or, um, or the range requirements and uh, facility needs, uh, impact points, that sort of thing. And we learn uh, whether that's compatible with what the spaceport resources are and White Sands resources, what we can do. And the goal is to determine if we can accommodate all of those activities um, within the confines of our EIS, uh, within our site license, uh, within the constraints of environmental and sometimes biological surveys that may need to be done in different parts of the spaceport. And we work very closely with the FAA's environmental division uh, to ensure that we comply with the requirements of our programmatic agreement uh, put in place for compliance with the uh, uh, pre uh, the Preservation of Historic uh, uh, Properties Act. And uh, so we always want to make sure we mitigate any archaeological uh, sites that have been located. Um, that can be a time-consuming process, but fortunately we don't always have to wait until it's complete. Usually we have, we work some with some really good environmental contractors um, who, can, who can read the tea leaves and working with our FAA uh, counterparts uh, who are coordinating with the BLM, the state land office, 
um, with the Park Service, uh, the State Historic Preservation Office, uh, we can get a pretty good idea of what we need to mitigate, if anything. And then we start negotiating a contract. And this can be as simple as a single launch contract or a single event or a series of events or it can be as complex as a lease agreement where we're establishing a relationship where a customer wants to have long-term research and development capabilities, um, establish new facilities, uh, testing, manufacturing operations, whatever the project is, we start with a set of terms and conditions that the state, um, as a state authority, uh, we require, but we conform each agreement to the needs of that customer. So no two agreements are the same. Uh, they're, they're all very different and they vary in length. And during that process, the customers, operations people work with our aerospace team and our project manager and uh, the flight operations people coordinate with White Sands to, um, to, uh, to, to reserve a flight window for the airspace um, to uh, deconflict any frequency bands that the customer may want to use uh, during their operations um, to determine if there are any impact points on the range and whether tracking or telemetry services uh, are going to need to be used. And uh, if it's a wavered launch, um, our flight operations people coordinate with ATO through Albuquerque Center and arrange to restrict the airspace during the time of launch. Although that's usually already done by White Sands, which restricts the airspace during the time period. So there's sometimes some overlap. Uh, TFRs usually aren't issued these days because that's taken care of by White Sands, but that's still an overlap in the process and um, we'll work through that. And that's generally what happens. And there are a lot of different types of operations that happen at the spaceport. It's not all vertical launching. We, you heard Dan Hicks yesterday talk about the activities at the vertical launching area. We've launched um, th over 300 uh, vertical launches, over 70 of which have been commercial um, standalone launches. Uh, but we also have act activity at the horizontal launching uh, complex uh, with Virgin Galactic. <clears throat> and each of those domains are separate, um, separate areas, separate facilities, um, and separate arrangements. So we coordinate all of those customers at the various uh, activity centers, and our operations people make sure that everybody um, uh, gets what they need. Um, so, Melissa, from a legal perspective, <clears throat> uh, how would you characterize the agreement between you and the users of the spaceport? I mean, it's a contract, as you said, and no two contracts look, look alike. But you are a supplier of launch and related facilities to the operator. So you're licensed by the FAA as a commercial spaceport. But that's a separate license from what the launch operator has to get. The launch operator has to get its own license. So you're, I mean, the way I look at it is you are a contractor to, a, a, for example, an FAA licensed launch operator, whether it's a vertical or a horizontal launch, that's, that's a, a licensing issue for the FAA to determine which part of the rules apply to a vertical launch or a horizontal launch or reentry. But you're, you're a contractor to that operator and they're your customer. Is that how you view it? That is exactly right. Okay. So just like the launch um, operator, we're also licensed by the FAA, but it's not um, a same level service. The launch operator is very much our customer. We serve our customers. Um, that's a contractual relationship, um, it, but and, and it is provided for within the, the, the Space Launch Act uh, regulations. Um, we have for, for licensed launches, we have cross waivers and indemnity provisions apply and all of that. For those launches that are not licensed, that are wavered, uh, we, have, we have our independent contracts that establish insurance requirements um, for each of them and outline duties and responsibilities. But you're right, it's exactly 
uh, they, we're, we are, we serve our customer, and that's, and those obligations are dictated by a contract. Great, thank you. I get that question a lot, and I wanted to, mm -hmm. I want people to hear it from you, because they look at me sometimes like, really, are you sure? I'm like, I'm sure, but let, let, let's, let's have Melissa explain it. Um, so speaking of the FAA, Christopher, um, despite the fact that you're not a lawyer, you somehow managed to take a leadership role in DC on uh, regulatory and policy issues regarding the FAA's um, very, very important new rulemaking on the streamlining of license launch activities. So let me just ask you, from, from SNC's perspective, and maybe you can talk about it more from your role as the chair of the Commercial Space Flight Federation's Regulatory and Policy Group, what, what are the challenges that exist for operators under the current FAA rules? What do the new rules purport to do? And how is that all getting sorted out? And you know, as the panel says, you know, where are we and where are we going on these issues? Great. Um, so many folks here in the audience have probably read a lot of the the news articles and everything that's out there, um, you know, some information out there is factual, others is a bit embellished. Um, so from the perspective of Sierra Nevada Corporation, um, the current rule set there are multiple different types of licenses that you can get as a vehicle operator depending on the type of operation that you're conducting. So to be clear, SNC seeks a reentry license for the reentry of Dream Chaser. The launch portion is actually handled by our launch vehicle provider, so ULA is handling that portion and we are a payload in their license and then the NASA payload that we're carrying for cargo resupply is a payload in a payload. It just kind of becomes this kind of nested uh, payload review. Uh, but then for the reentry of Dream Chaser, ULA is not involved in that and uh, we are the licensee with the FAA and then our payload is what's contained within Dream Chaser. And that's what <clears throat> subsequently goes through the review uh, with the FAA. Now, if you look at the licenses, there's a couple different flavors of license for launch vehicle and then a license provision for reentry vehicles. But that reentry vehicle license, if you read the regulatory text, actually references back to launch vehicle licenses. And there's some things that are fundamentally different between the operations that I think were kind of just brushed over when the regulations were originally put in place because reentry wasn't maybe as prevalent as it's starting to become and that we see this transition into the future. So what we were hoping to see out of the NPRM and the regulatory streamlining is the consolidation of the regulations into one size fits all uh, performance based regulation versus a prescriptive type uh, regulation that allows for adaptation to different concepts, to different technologies, to different styles of operation or different types of operation. Um, and we saw a lot of that in the NPRM, but there were some key features in there that seemed to be very rooted in a lot of the uh, legacy ways of doing things for commercial um, <clears throat> and uh, non-commercial launch vehicle uh, historical providers. And so, uh, some of our comments and what you'll see in the Federal Register is just pushing back on, you know, making sure that reentry is also captured equally in there and it's not as launch centric as maybe uh, the industry seems to, to approach these things. Um, and looking for a performance based set of regulations. So uh, a, a set that has a lot of governing documents that can be used to reference uh, acceptable means of compliance where the regulation itself sets the performance standard rather than the regulation outlining the means of compliance in itself, because we know that the regulatory cycle to update things as technology progresses takes years, whereas technology is progressing at a much faster pace. Whereas these supporting documents that aren't codified officially in the regulations, but are used as acceptable means to the regulations can be updated at a much faster pace to adapt to modern technology to new analysis techniques. And so shifting to a framework where we have this more adaptive uh, regulatory set, performance base, as I mentioned, uh, I think is the end goal for us. And what you'll see in a lot of the comments and, and the, the uh, elements that we put forth in the Federal Register, both within the CSF community as well as directly from Sierra Nevada. So Christopher, before we leave this topic, in addition to the, the formal rulemaking, the notice of proposed rulemaking that was published and the comment period um, during which time people submitted comments to the docket, Sort of maybe before that or parallel to that, what were these aviation rulemaking advisory committees or ARCs? And there was one, at least one, maybe two, stood up for specifically for the reason of looking at these regulatory issues that affect the space launch industry. What did, did SNC have a role in these arcs? And can you explain what is the role of an arc in this process? And will there be an ongoing role of these advisory committees in this rulemaking process? 
Great. Um, so I'll admit, you know, ARCs were a very kind of foreign thing, I think, to the space industry. Um, this was a tool that the FAA used uh, early on. So after SBD2 came out, there was a extreme pressure in order to, uh, you know, streamline the regulations, you know, very compressed timelines that the FAA is working towards. And so one of the, there were three aviation rulemaking committees that came out at the time. And one of which was focused on industry's inputs for streamlining the launch and reentry regulations. And so I think we had roughly six weeks to basically come together as an industry group, uh, put together kind of where are we, where are we going, you know, what do we all agree on, what don't we agree on, and try and consolidate kind of an industry report and uh, filed that with the FAA. And then the FAA was able to use that as the basis of, you know, some inputs to, you know, their regulatory efforts moving forward. Uh, two other arcs that were uh, uh, put into place, uh, one that looked at the prioritization of the airspace. Um, so the National Airspace System, or the NAS, as it's referred to, there's a lot of users. Uh, all of us, for most of us here, took planes, uh, flew here, uh, so they're a major user of commercial aviation. You have UAS, which is becoming extremely involved in uh, the airspace. You have rockets and reentry vehicles that are transcending that airspace. So there's a compression on the use of that airspace, and there's a lot of conflicts now arising where people want to use the airspace at the same time, uh, but we're rooted in some older technologies and older analytic analytic techniques that, you know, maintain safety within the NAS, but are probably overly conservative to where we are, need to be today. So that arc looked at how we can, you know, streamline that, get a little bit more efficient, and, uh, you know, either implement some kind of priority, uh, priority schema or optimization schema to the NAS to, to alleviate some of those touch points. And then the third arc, uh, in essence, he was involved in all three of these, was with regards to spaceport categorization. Um, so there's several spaceports now in the U.S. that are looking to, and internationally, that are looking to dual use uh, airport facilities with spaceport facilities. And so you start to see some rubs between, you know, conflicts of interest between um, different user sets within the NAS and then the ground infrastructure as well, and how do we manage this moving forward and provide this national asset that we have that is the airspace, uh, you know, free and equitable access to all users moving forward. So that's what we focused on. In terms of ARCs moving forward in this process, um, I think the option is out there. I don't know any definitive plans. I think that's well within the FAA at this point, but uh, I will say from Sierra Nevada's perspective, you know, we're ready to support any way we can to help continue to foster the dialogue across the different user sets of the NAS as well as uh, uh, help with the streamlining of these regulations. Great, thank you very much. So Kelly, I'd like to ask you um, pretty much the same fundamental questions that I asked Christopher because obviously US, ULA, incredible heritage in the ELV world, um, big user of the federal ranges, long-standing licensee of the FAA. Um, what is ULA's position on you know, life under the existing rules, the whole streamlining effort? Were you guys involved in the ARC? Just talk to us a little bit about ULA's perspective on these issues. Sure. <clears throat> Excuse me. Sure. So um, ULA's perspective is that the, that the commercial licensing uh, process is, is a demanding process and that it should be demanding in the, because the FAA is responsible for protecting public safety and for protecting critical assets. So um, we think that under the the new regulations, there's more flexibility to for for companies to provide their own performance-based safety um, processes. Um, but but it all, the new regulations also require um, that companies prove that they, that they can in fact meet the safety requirements. Um, one of the biggest challenges for ULA is um, to us that that we think that across the most of the companies involved in the ARC would agree, is that um, there should be a single set of licensing rules for all companies, I'm sorry, for all agencies at the federal ranges. So for example, you could have um, a launch from a federal range and you could have to report to the FAA, to NASA, and to the federal ranges about, or to the federal range, about different safety requirements. Um, and the effort can be du duplicative. So we think that um, there can be progress made to move, for, move towards having a single set of, of licensing rules. Um, we think the FAA has, has made some good progress in the, in the proposed rule, uh, but we do, we do look forward to continuing to work with them um, and with, with the Air Force and NASA and the federal ranges to have one set of rules um, across the various agencies. 
Um, and one point on the, the streamlining licensing arc, um, the FAA was able to take a lot of the industry input. I think about 70% of the industry input was incorporated into the proposed rule. So we think that the FAA did a really good job of working with industry. They're continuing to provide industry a lot of information. Um, and we think that the, the, the rule really hits the mark and, and we're looking forward to working with the FAA going forward to continue to, to, to make the rule better. So um, I wanna get back to that point, but before we leave, uh, these comments, Kelly, I, I want to ask you about your use of the federal ranges versus spaceports. Now, I, I understand that, for example, in your relationship with SNC, the, the Dream Chaser is going to fly on a, on a Vulcan, I assume, out of a federal range. And Christopher, you, SNC is going to be a user of spaceports as well. Um, but Kelly, does ULA see life at a spaceport or because of the nature of your vehicles, you have to always be at federal ranges? ULA operates from Cape Canaveral Air Force Station and Vandenberg Air Force Base, and we will continue to do so. Uh, we don't see spaceports as part of our, mm -hmm. our future, but certainly support their efforts. And Christopher, tell us about um, SNC, Dream Chaser, and spaceports. What's, what's your relationship with spaceports going Absolutely. Forward? So um, we're interested in landing wherever our customers uh, need us to land. Um, so currently we have a contract with NASA for six flights to the International Space Station carrying cargo resupply. Um, within that agreement with NASA, um, we've agreed to use uh, the shuttle landing facility uh, at Kennedy Space Center, which is now operated by Space Florida and is in the process of seeking their licensing in order to support commercial reentries. So similar to what uh, Melissa was saying earlier, the site itself needs to be licensed as a spaceport. And there's actually two types of licenses. There's a part 420 and a 433. So 420 is for launch vehicles um, and suborbital rockets are considered launch vehicles because they go up and come down, but they don't have a decision point between going up and coming down, so it's all considered launch. And then there's a reentry side of the license, which is the part 433. So for Dream Chaser to land as a spaceport, they require the 433 license. We require under the current regulations a part 435 license. Uh, so between those two, then we can uh, commercially operate. Um, but moving forward, we are definitely looking at derivative technologies of Dream Chaser, other use cases of Dream Chaser away from uh, solely supporting NASA, uh, you know, purely NASA missions. Uh, Dream Chaser free flyer missions, we're looking uh, for LEO commercialization opportunities to service other low Earth orbit destinations with Dream Chaser. So looking into that paradigm and that business model moving forward, we're definitely interested in integrating with other spaceports uh, and the infrastructure that we have here in the US and around the world. That gives us resiliency uh, on certain missions, so then we can have contingency sites if weather's bad or there's an issue somewhere. Um, and then it also gives our users, our payloads, um, and our customers a lot of opportunity to maybe go to a site that is located near some lab facility that they need for post-processing, or gives them access to the distribution that they need for any materials or products that they they've developed in space. So we're definitely looking to build this global network where we can serve our customers uh, better and more rapidly moving forward. Great, thank you. So, um, so Kelly mentioned that you know, ULA is um, you know, very pleased with the progress the FAA has made on the, on the regs. Christopher, there are other members of your committee that might not have that view. Dennis, um, you know, you're dealing with your clients who are not exactly thrilled with maybe where NOAA is right now. Maybe people are a little more satisfied at FCC. My point simply is that this is a diverse industry, both from the launch, the spaceport, the federal range, the payload side. What can interested industry and in the interested public do to make sure that their voice is heard? Um, obviously, everything is going to be in accordance with the Administrative Procedure Act or whatever other you know, lobbying laws that may apply. But when your clients come to you, Dennis, and they say, you know, I need help getting my, my message across to the federal regulator, uh, what, are you, what, are you, what is your advice? Well, there's really two, two different categories of, of client here. There's big companies who have experienced, qualified people that follow this, that know how to do it don't have trouble doing it, can get things done. ULA obviously is in that category, Lockheed Martin, Boeing, so, so forth. And we saw this with the, the export regulations as well. All the big guys were happy, pretty much. They knew how to do the business. 
problem is with the little guys, the startups, small businesses, medium-sized businesses, and their problem is they don't even know they've got an issue. And so they're not coming and asking me what to do, <laughs> and, and you, except in rare circumstances. There's a lot of people out there that don't understand that they should be participating in these rulemakings, they should be uh, voicing their opinions, and they need to pay, pay attention to what's going on in Washington. A lot of people, you know, when you're building a rocket in your garage, you may, you're not thinking about that, right? Right, right. Yeah. right. So Christopher, that um, leads me to ask you to talk about the, the Commercial Space Flight Federation, which is a group of these, I mean, it's a big group. I don't want to categorize anyone in particular, but companies that wanted to come together and speak uh, maybe with one voice as opposed to independently, and that's how you got the honor of being <laughs> the chair of the Regulatory and Policy Committee. Tell, yeah. tell us about that. Yeah, so I think I said at the beginning, yeah. a series of unfortunate events, right? right. Um, so, uh, yes, and it was an honor to serve this last year as chair of the regulatory committee within CSF. Um, but yeah, there is a, a fundamental challenge there, and what was being touched on a moment ago is, you know, we do have within CSF membership quite the array of companies from large, you know, companies uh, that are launching on a fairly regular cadence to a lot of smaller companies that are really just getting their feet wet in the regulatory world. They don't have a team of people in DC who are following these things on a daily basis. And so that's uh, one of the benefits that we found kind of in that environment of coming together as industry um, and kind of sharing, uh, you know, our issues, areas that we've had lessons learned. You know, there's, there's a certain collective pool of information that is beneficial to the entire industry. And so we found a lot of uh, progress in being able to come together, talk about these things, and then go forward with, you know, as united of a voice as we can. And so what we found in the NPRM process in drafting our comments is there are certain provisions in the proposed rule that do make things quite challenging for smaller companies. And maybe the one size fit all is a little too skewed towards big traditional rockets that have a lot of fuel, a lot of potential, and a lot of risk to the public. And so those should definitely be treated, and, and I do want to make sure that my comments are caveated today, that it is 100% the intent of Sierra Nevada Corporation, as well as uh, the Commercial Space Flight Federation, to maintain public safety, to maintain safety within the national airspace system. That, in our view, should never be compromised. But there is a scaling factor to that. When you're talking about launching a small, launch vehicle out of a very remote destination, maybe the performance safety factor there can be scaled such that it doesn't have to follow the same rigor as what is being developed to launch that's near populated areas that has a lot of uh, you know, risk potential to it, those kind of things. So there's definitely uh, a, a sliding factor there um, that we had to take into consideration and you'll see that in our comments. Well, thank you. I got distracted with all these questions from the audience. I'm so glad everybody is so engaged. It's fantastic. Yeah. So um, thank you, panelists. I, we now are going to make ourselves available to everybody in Great. the audience. So uh, you want me to take these? Are you going to? OK. Yeah. All right. So here's. This is a new system. Right. These two, are there any mm -hmm. laws in place to prevent militarization of the moon or Mars? And then the same. Uh, Related question, how do you prevent NGOs from developing mm -hmm. militarized assets in mm -hmm. space? Let's okay. start yeah. there. Yeah, so I'll, I'll take the, this question. I'll, let me repeat it. So, um, and then we'll open it up to the panel as well. So the question basically is about the militarization of space. And, you know, how does that work? Or is it, is it prohibited? Or how can it be prevented? I mean, depending on your perspective, you know, the answer, you know, the, the way you pose the question uh, might, might vary. But you know, I just want to say very briefly that there are a series of um, international treaties that govern space activities. There are five. Um, quickly, the Outer Space Treaty, the Liability Convention, the Rescue and Return Agreement, the Registration Convention, and the Moon Treaty. The United States is a signatory to four of the five. We are not a signatory to the Moon Treaty. And in each one of those treaties, there is a, um, well, rescue and return deals with, for example, an astronaut 
ending up in another part of the world and that other part of the world being obligated by international law to return the astronaut to his or her home country. The registration Convention says that if you launch an object into space, you have to register it with a registry that exists at the UN. You, the private actor, would register it through the federal agency of your home country that's regulating your activity, but ultimately it, it ends up in a registry maintained at the Office of Outer Space Affairs of the United Nations. But the Outer Space Treaty and the Liability Convention, and I'm giving you the highly abridged version here, um, are the two treaties that require this, this, the states' parties, the countries that have signed up to these treaties, to license and regulate and supervise the activities of their nationals. And an element of that is, is you know, how much sort of military action can take place in outer space. But you know, the question is, and I mean, and the, you know, the goal theoretically is none, but you know, as a practical matter is how do, we de how do we define militarization or weaponization? Is it a defensive act? Is it an offensive act? Which is prohibited, which is, you know, so I'd like to be able to give a specific answer to the people who, several people who've asked questions about the quote unquote militarization of space. Francesca, if I may. Yeah, please. I, I think the assumption is false. Okay. Because space is militarized. It's not a question, is it going to be? It already is. It's just a domain. It's like airspace. It's like the the oceans. And there's lots and lots of military activity in space. The only international obligation is not to put nuclear weapons. Uh, in space or on the moon or other uh, celestial bodies. Um, now, how you approach that from a policy and political point of view is a different matter than a legal point of view. Right, and how, but, and how you define military action, I think, is a well, big element of Well, you know, international law <laughs> applies to space activities as well as, as, as uh, the, space, the space treaties. So, uh, you know, what's, what's legal under the UN Charter, what's legal under the law of, of warfare, uh, or, or not legal, um, it, it applies in space as well. So all those, all those uh, provisions of international law apply to the domain of space as well as cyber and yep. other domains. And there's a legal subcommittee meeting of the UN Committee on the Peaceful Uses of Outer Space every year that takes up issues like this. Um, okay, should we move on to another question? Okay. Yes. Um, How about this one? Sure. Yeah, so keeping in the international area. This, this one next, though. Okay, you want this one? Well, go ahead. Okay. With yours, and then let's make sure we get that. Okay. So the question is are there export control issues <laughs> and issues regarding uh, foreign direct investment in space companies under the it's called the Defense Production Act, uh, under which a committee known as the Committee on Foreign Investment in the United States operates. And that's a set of laws and a committee that is designed to understand when a foreign investor or a foreign entity wants to either make a significant investment in or, or, or acquire a US company that is critical to the United States. Critical infrastructure is a phrase that's often used, but it's actually much broader than that. And in fact, there recently were amendments to the uh, laws regarding CFIUS to actually broaden the scope of the committee. And this has significant impact on the space industry because a lot of space companies are sort of critical to the infrastructure, critical to US national security, significant foreign policy interests. And yes, so space companies have to be very knowledgeable of what to do legally if they seek to uh, uh, accept an investment from a foreign national or be acquired by a foreign company. I know, Dennis, you have a lot of experience in this area. Can you speak Yeah, to uh, the, the, the uh, first question was, uh, does export control uh, apply here? Right. Of course it does. Yeah. And it's very critical in the space area. Uh, anything to do with launch is controlled by, under the ITAR, the International Traffic and Arms Regulations, uh, satellites are split between the two depending on the technology involved. Um, and uh, even though um, there was a deregulation uh, of satellite technologies, many of the technologies that moved over to the Commerce Department still are 
considered to be critical technologies for CFIUS purposes because they're controlled for national security reasons. Um, I, I've, I've read recently a lot of criticism from the space industry that they're being the cut off from possible funding from Chinese sources because of CFIUS. The fact of the matter is there's no way that a significant investment in any kind of critical technology from China is going to be allowed <laughs> right now. Yeah, just forget it. You know, you're going to waste your time. It's very expensive to go through this process. There's a lot of material, that information that has to be developed. So be careful where you're going to think you're going to get your money. So my, my advice is, sorry, but stay away from China. Um, let me open to the panel. Um, how do you manage your export control issues? Do you have these foreign direct investment issues? Um, if the answer is no, that's okay. But I mean, I'm sure, I know you all you all deal with export control. Many of you have been on ISPC, ISP, ISPCS before. We've done whole panels on export control. But just briefly, anybody want to comment on foreign direct investment or export control? Uh, the New Mexico Spaceport Authority is a state executive agency, so we don't deal with with yeah. that, that issue, some of our, our customers may, yeah. but I can't speak for them, so. Yeah, from Sierra Nevada perspective, um, uh, we're wholly owned uh, here in the US. Um, but on the export side, you know, I mentioned earlier that we're looking to grow our network of spaceports, you know, where we can conduct our activities. And the fact of the matter is, is landing Dream Chaser outside of the US is considered an export in itself. So, you know, working through elements there and understanding what those impacts are, um, you know, a lot of the treaties that were listed earlier were conceived in an era where um, it was government to government relationships, and now you're talking about uh, commercial to maybe government or to other commercial relationships. So there's a lot of gray area in there. And uh, I have many textbooks that I'm trying to read and get caught up on. This is, they do not teach this in engineering school, but uh, it is, uh, it's a very interesting topic. And uh, it's, it's a good question. I think that in terms of where we're going, this is going to be something that does not go away. Yeah. And ULA has an active global trade control group Absolutely. that is, is extremely busy, but yeah. one of the issues they are not working is foreign investment. Right. Yeah. <laughs> yep. yep. But Francisco, I yes. think maybe we should talk about this because, you know, the controls don't just apply to equipment. They apply to technology. Mm -hmm. And I think where people get in trouble is that they don't recognize that technology transfers are controlled. <clears throat> And when you have foreign employees, foreign national employees, you have an export issue. So you have to be careful about that. You have to be aware of that. Uh, when you've got a foreign investor, you know, what kind of rights does that foreign investor have in seeing your technology? Mm -hmm. Do they, you know, there, there are mitigation uh, measures that you can employ to make sure that there isn't a technology transfer and you can get through all of these CFIUS reviews but it, it's really the technology, not the hardware, that's right. the issue. Right, the know-how. Yep. 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 OK, so how are we doing on time? Um, you have 10 minutes. OK. Oh, this good. one is interesting. OK. I do so. so the question is, if an actor in violation of regulations has assets on orbit, how do you enforce compliance? And can you force suspension of access? So um, it's a really complicated question, and which is why it was asked, I'm sure, Never because you're dealing with you know, on-orbit assets, on-orbit activities. Um, and there are all sorts of different things that could have been violated. I mean, it could, theoretically, could be export control, could be FCC regulations, as you might have seen earlier this year with um, the Constellation on a Swarm, which was launched on a PSLV out of India, um, but they didn't have their FCC license. It was a US system, didn't have their FCC license before they flew. FCC was extremely unhappy about that. Um, a lot of forgiveness was requested. Um, but uh, let me open it up to the panel. Anybody have any views on what, ha I mean, you know, don't do anything wrong. I guess that's sort of the first point. And I always say, I always tell my clients, asking forgiveness is really hard in this industry. The government requires you by law to ask for permission. It's a pro proactive, do it in advance set of rules. It is not a do it and see what happens. And if you don't like it, you can come say, I'm sorry. It's really not how it works. Well, if 
I'll volunteer something. It's not really within the spaceport realm because this is on orbit, on orbit activity. But one of the problems is, although uh, countries party to the outer space uh, treaty are obligated to um, authorize and continually supervise the activities of their non-governmental uh, entities in space and on orbit. Um, the states currently don't have an authority okay. that uh, a governmental authority Excellent. that is explicitly designated to uh, control those activities. There are some uh, provisions in uh, the launch licensing process that make payload review processes. There's some FCC um, uh, uh, regulations that, that govern some, some activities of remote sensing satellites and others. But that is something the SPD-3, the new uh, uh, space transportation management uh, policy uh, that was announced uh, in June of 2018, is designed to get at. And I think that's going to be part of this, this new, the, the new policy development within the federal agencies, taking uh, a whole of uh, nation approach, a holistic approach to try to make sure that there is, uh, that we uphold our international obligations to uh, authorize and supervise our nationals in outer space. But yeah, there's so not all activities require permission by law. Yeah. And that, there's the rub, right? That's, that's getting at that not having an authorizing uh, agency that exactly. tells them what to exactly. do. Exactly, and, and, and George, you, you live <clears> through <throat> this debate. Uh, should the FAA do it? Should the Commerce Department do it? Uh, I mean, this is one of my pet peeves. Why, you know, what's, make a decision, come on. Get on with it. Let's, let's fulfill our obligation as a nation to other nations and, and authorize. I don't care who does it. Personally, I don't care. Just that somebody has to do it. But we're unable to agree on it. It's really, really sad, I think. Well, we have so many questions. Just brace yourselves for lunch because we're not going to get through all of them. So if you thought you were going to eat, forget about it. Go hide, get a plate and hide in a corner. Um, all right, I'm going to just try to go through some of the questions and see what we can do. So he, very interesting, out of the box kind of question, um, issue we haven't touched upon. Will biological contamination be strictly regulated? Will regulations be in place to mitigate um, tardigrade? Did I say it right? Tardigrade. I mean, I know what it is, but I don't know how to say it. Pollution. Um, anybody have an opinion? Also not an engineering school. Yeah, like, <laughs> so I mean, I, I mean, I would, I would, I would imagine that. I mean, I know this is already an issue because this issue came up recently. Um, you know, there there has to be a mechanism for you know making sure that outer space and celestial bodies aren't polluted. I just don't know the process for that. I don't know what ultimately is going to be the process. But if you if you look at it from a regulatory point of view, is there? Is there really anything that could have prevented this? Because, I mean, there's going to be circumstances where no matter what you do as a regulator, how diligent you are, how diligent the person that is making the application is, that things are gonna happen. Uh, and in this case, it sounds like it was one individual who pulled a prank yeah. and, and is unapologetic about it. Yeah. So, Really, is it, is it really a regulatory issue at, at that point? I, I'm not sure it is, because you're always gonna have those circumstances. Call them black swans if you want, whatever. Yeah. Can't do anything about it. Yeah, but I guess you, you don't want people to do it you know, intentionally. I mean, this, a prank is intentional, but maybe if you had a deterrent, a regulatory or a legal deterrent, or an international legal mechanism to deter that behavior. I just don't know, I mean, I, perhaps it'll be an agenda item at the UN legal subcommittee meeting. Well, I'll come to the Galloway Symposium and we're probably gonna have a panel on this very time. There you go, good. Everybody come to the Galloway Space Law Symposium in DC in December. We'll take this up. Um, 
Okay, another really good question. Given that this is the International Symposium on Personal Commercial Space Flight, how do U.S. regulations compare to other countries? And do we anticipate commercial f space flights under flags of convenience? Anybody have an opinion on that? Well, we go ahead. Know. No, go ahead. I, well, I mean, Alyssa, I think this I'm is a great question for you. I'm speaking too much here, I think. So. I mean, an, an issue that, that, that clients come to me with is everybody wants to fly all over the world. So, you know, I have a new rocket. I want to fly out of fill-in-the-blank country. Yeah, what? I'm going to be speaking in a couple weeks at the IAC on the issue of space traffic management. And this came up during the paper that I prepared for that, um, that colloquium. Um, although it's not a spaceport specific issue, uh, the, the United States has the most, I believe, the most well-developed regulatory system in the world. Now, as I, I just, just told you in my, my previous answer, it's not perfect. There are huge gaps in it. But compared to the rest of the world, we've got a really well-elaborated uh, legal and regulatory uh, system uh, where most spa space actors know what their left and right bounds are uh, in, in launching and re-entering and for the most part what they're going to be doing out in space. The flags of convenience issue is something that I think we have to be careful of because as, as states become um, more diligent in making sure their regulations uh, protect against uh, uh, wrongdoers in space, there could be a potential for industry to feel constrained too much so that they start looking for the least restrictive country to go to in order to get their payloads into orbit. And that's sort of a delicate balance that uh, regulatory agencies have to pay attention to when they're developing national, national laws. And we just recently, fairly recently, uh, uh, saw this with that, the swarm constellation that, that launched four satellites from an India uh, uh, spacecraft in India after being denied a license by the FCC. Uh, now, in, in all fairness to swarm, They've, you know, they've come around. They're trying to be a good space actor, and you know, they're 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 complying. But that is the kind of thing that we're concerned about happening, and that's just a, a fairly recent sign that that's something that everybody needs to be careful about as we start regulating uh, uh, more widely. One of my clients went through the payload review for a New Zealand launch. Mm -hmm. Very efficient. Very easy. Still good. I mean, they 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 did a good job, but Thorough. it's you know, it's faster. It's, yeah. <laughs> it's a lot faster. So we are within a minute of being done, but I want to end on this really really great question. You know, I want to combine two two great questions. What is it? What are the differences differences between doing sort of standard law and space law? And you know, what do what are our lawyer peers think of us doing space law? Do they think it's silly and, you know, do, are, are we condescended to or, you know, more realistically, they're just jealous? Um, I would say, you know, and others can answer up, but very quickly, uh, it, being a lawyer is being a lawyer. You have to understand the law. You have to understand how, it, how, how a statute operates, how regulations implement a statute. You have to understand the Constitution. You have to know your rights because your job is to vigorously advocate on behalf of your clients, make sure your client's rights are respected, and make sure your client understands what's permissible under the law. So it's the same. What makes it different, and what makes it, in my very personal biased opinion, so wonderful, is the industry. There, for me, there is no cooler industry. To get, I mean, to get to write contracts that deal with satellites and launch vehicles and spaceports and payloads and experiments and planetary exploration and human spaceflight. I mean, taking those issues and saying what laws apply to them and how can we um, create an environment that's, uh, that follows the rule of law in space and on the ground with space assets is what makes space law so special. That's what, that's what I think. Kelly. Well, I'm just thrilled to be a part of it, I can tell you that. I think there's a really amazing community, and I think there's a bridge from kind of 
the older generation to the newer generation to try to teach the younger lawyers. Um, I think it's, it's pretty special to be a part of, of the potential of what's out there of human exploration. Um, I think there's a lot of really amazing activity going on right now. Um, one of the things about space law is that it's not maybe quite as tested as, as family law, right? There's, there's a strict rule of, of family law and maybe, you know, maybe some people have some thoughts about that, I don't know. But, but, but with space law, it's, it's kind of always evolving and, and trying to keep up with industry is important while driving the, the importance of public safety, for example, with what we're talking about here. So um, it's, a, it's a constant balancing act. Uh, it's, it's always evolving, you're always learning, but um, it's really, really special to be part of this community and, um, and I'm, I feel so grateful that I landed here in space law. Yeah, and Christopher, you're just here by accident. <laughs> <laughs> just appreciative to have been invited. <laughs> as somebody who, who does both uh, sort of ordinary law, as, as a, the space part lawyer and space law, the space lawyer is always the most popular person at a cocktail party. <laughs> it's, a, it's a less eloquent explanation than Francesca and Kelly had, <laughs> but... That, that is a, a key difference. If I could just add, my, I have a two and a half year old son who says that mom goes up on rocket ships at school, so. Can't beat that. Yeah. <laughs> yes, but how do you explain what you do at your high school reunion? No. Uh, well. Leave it to the imagination. Yes, exactly. <laughs> exactly. Dennis, I know you like being a space lawyer. Dennis was my mentor. Dennis was my first boss and my space law mentor, so. Well, you know, we, uh, I caught the bug <laughs> a long time ago, and uh, it, it's wonderful. The technology is fantastic. You always get to do, deal with something new because the, the technology is evolving. So the policy issues and the legal issues always are evolving. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, this is not like writing wills in estates, so, uh, you know. Yep. Yeah. <laughs> no, not at all. You're not doing the same thing every day, and that's what makes it so fun. Well, thanks, everybody, for your wonderful attention and your great interest. And yeah, let's go have lunch.